Welcome back. In this video, we'll use ratio analysis to assess the characteristics of different firms. Now, what I'll do is I'll start off by taking a look or showing you guys some competitors' ratios, and we'll see the differences between those competitors based on certain characteristics. And then we'll jump into some time trend analysis, and then we'll wrap up with a very basic common size financial statement example. So this is all empirically based. Okay, so how do we use ratios? Well, there are two primary ways that we use ratios. We can use them using time trend analysis, where we look at the same ratio through time and see how it changes, or we can use peer group or peer analysis, where we compare a firm's ratios with those of its direct competitors. Now, there is one additional way that we can use ratios that's a bit broader, though. It's called common size financial statement analysis. And with common size financial statement analysis, basically we scale the financial statement by the largest line item of the statement. So if we're talking about balance sheets, a common size financial, a common size balance sheet would be scaled by total assets. A common size income statement would be scaled by total sales revenue. Okay, so let's take a look at our first example. Now a couple of years ago I used to teach this case study class and one of the examples that I used in that class was, can you identify some direct competitors using the real-world data that you know I had in this case? So I thought it would be a good idea to just kind of show you an example of how we can use ratio analysis. So let's take a look at two direct competitors uh, in the books and music industry. So you know we have two firms, G and H. One firm focuses on selling primarily to customers through its vast retail store presence. Uh, the company is a leader in traditional book retailing and focuses on a community store concept. And it also mains, maintains an online presence and has a publishing imprint. Uh, so I'll just uh, give you the straightforward here. This one is going to be Barnes and Noble. Uh, the other one sells books, movies, music, videos, all through its website. Over three quarters of its sales are media. This is a very early version of Amazon. And it also sells electronics and other general merchandise. Uh, it only recently became profitable, and it's followed an aggressive strategy of acquisition. All right, so this one, obviously Amazon. And it's from an early year in Amazon. So can we use this information to determine exactly which firm is which? So we've got this information. One of these, Barnes & Noble, is primarily based on a vast retail store presence. Uh, it is, you know, focuses on, uh, it does have a publishing imprint, so there's probably some uh, trademarks out there. Uh, whereas Amazon, you know, it's, it's all electronic. So yes, they have some warehouses, but they follow an aggressive strategy of acquisition. And generally, it's all sold through the website. So let's see if we can take this information and determine which firm is which. So we've got some information for two competitors here. The cash ratio for firm G is significantly higher than for firm H, indicating that it's uh, much more liquid than firm H. Uh, inventory, a lot higher for firm H. Uh, also fixed assets, take a look at that. So we got some differences here. Uh, intangibles, again, higher for firm H. Uh, debt, significantly higher for firm G. And beta here, notice it's above one, so uh, for firm G, it's, it's much more risky in terms of market risk. And then ultimately, firm G does have higher inventory turnover. Okay, so which firm is which? Well, basically, we've got two firms. One of the Amazon and the other is Barnes & Noble. Well, firm G is actually Amazon. Firm H is Barnes & Noble. How can we determine this? Well, start off with the inventory. I mean, Barnes & Noble, it's got fixed assets, it's got stores, and it's got to stock those shelves with a lot of inventory. So that's why its inventory ratio is so much higher than Amazon. Same thing with fixed assets. It's got a lot of store, a lot of retail presences to maintain. Uh, it might have a lot more intangibles because it might have some patents or some trademarks. Uh, also, less long-term debt. So as was noted in the case, Amazon has made a lot more purchases uh, or acquisitions of competitors. It's also an online store, so you know much much more risky. 
and it's got higher inventory turnover, you know, because online retailer doesn't have a whole lot of inventory. So this is one way that we can use uh, ratio analysis. Okay, one additional example here. I pulled this data from, oh, let's say the middle of 2008. Let's say September of 2008. Uh, so this data, we have a couple of you know, liquidity ratios, some long-term solvency ratios, profitability, and market value. So of these th uh, four competitors, you can see some differences. If we were to determine which one is in a weaker financial state, well, let's start off with solvency ratios here. Notice here, all these firms are hugely levered up. You know, the lowest here is 10, so $10 of uh, liabilities or debt for every $1 of equity. That is insanely high. It indicates that if these are all in the same industry, this is probably the financial services industry. Uh, so notice here, firm A is significantly more highly levered than the others. Uh, it also happens to be less liquid, depending on pretty much every metric here. So cash ratio, current ratio, uh, essentially firm A, very illiquid, very highly levered. Also, uh, not that profitable. And then also, it's, it's got a lower valuation here based on P-E ratio. So, uh, what are these firms? Well, these are four very large investment banks immediately prior to the 2008 financial crisis. Firm A is actually Lehman Brothers. These are the last data points right before it defaulted on its debt. So notice here, 29. I think, uh, depending on how you calculate it, it went as high as 36 dollars of debt for every dollar of equity. But I mean, quite frankly, this is enormous. If I saw this for any firm, that's a major red flag. Okay, uh, one additional example. Let's take a look at Tesla's financial position and its performance relative to its direct competitors. So I'll tell you what, we'll just compare Tesla over the last couple of years to Ford over the last couple of years. So we're basically going to use time trend and peer group analysis. Okay, so here we go. So I pulled some data from Bloomberg on both Tesla and then Ford's over here. Uh, so Tesla, we have their uh, ROE, ROA over a couple of year period. Notice here that we've got some very large negative numbers. Tesla really didn't become pop, uh, profitable until about 2019-ish. So it's, I mean, it's a newer, faster growing company than Ford. But, you know, for the time period for which I pulled this data, uh, it really wasn't that profitable. Uh, also, notice here, you know, it, the, it is trending in the right direction. Uh, and then also if I go down here to, oh, say like our liquidity ratios. Tesla for a long time was, you know, relatively liquid. But in the later years here, you know, 2015, 2016, 2018, its current ratio below one here in the last two years, which is a big red flag. And then its cash ratio is quite low. Uh, it also appears to have taken on a large amount of debt, you know, especially right here. And then, you know, it still had a large amount of debt, uh, even in the latter period. And then also it's Altman Z-score, which uh, we'll talk about in class. Uh, basically, this is a metric, uh, default prediction metric. If the number is above three, you're generally pretty safe. If it's below 1.8, we generally in the financial industry say that's a, a pretty big red flag it indicates uh, you're more likely to default. So we have a couple of years here where this firm is absolutely below 1.8. And that's pretty much it. So that is Tesla in a nutshell. Ford, on the other hand, uh, notice here over the same period, very, very profitable. ROE, never negative. ROA, never negative. Uh, gross margins, pretty healthy. I mean, look at that. 16% gross margin in 2013. Uh, yeah, dividend payout ratio. Ford is known for paying dividends. They really did pay dividends until just prior or during the financial crisis, and then they initiated initiated a dividend back in 2012 again. Also, fairly liquid. Notice here that the last four years of the sample, you know, current ratio above one, that's pretty healthy. Uh, they are, however, much more highly levered than Tesla, which had, I think, a leverage or a debt to equity ratio in the hundreds. Ford's is 200 or 300 uh, percent here in some of these later years. Uh, Z-score, a little lower than Tesla though. So, you know, default prediction, 
pretty high here. I think what's driving that is the high debt to equity ratio and debt to total assets ratio. Okay, so uh, how do we typically compare competitors over time using ratios? Well, quite frankly, we in finance, we like to use a lot of charts. So what I did was I took our Ford's ROE, Tesla's ROE, and I just plotted it. So you know, one of the primary things we like to do with ratio analysis is, yes, calculate the ratios, but you know, our charts help us see these way more easily. As you can see, Ford, uh, profitable, you know, positive ROE for pretty much the entire sample. Uh, Tesla, negative ROE, although it's becoming more uh, closer to positive, if you will. ROA, same thing. Ford in blue, still you know, profitable. Tesla, not profitable, get, but trending in the right direction. So that's generally how we use trend analysis or time trend analysis and peer group analysis. Okay, one final topic before I wrap this video up. I mentioned common size financial statements. And common size financial statements are incredibly useful to us as analysts. They allow us to see how line items differ across firms and also differ across the same firm through time. So like I said, when we calculate these common size financial statements, you know, we, we're dividing everything on the balance sheet by total assets, and we're dividing everything on the income statement by our top line metric, our sales revenue. So let's do that. Okay, so I have here Tesla's income statements over a period of time, so 2019 through 2023. Uh, obviously, we see a lot of stuff here. There's some very, very large numbers. Uh, if I wanted to convert this into common size financial statements to make it easier for me to analyze how things are changing for the firm, the you know basically all I'm doing is just taking everything here and dividing it by total revenue. I don't know why total or gross profit is up here at the very top. Uh, this is how I downloaded it. Uh, so let's just go ahead and do that. Okay, so we're just gonna take total revenue or whatever our, our metric is and divide it by our total revenue. And I'll put a dollar sign in front of the four to lock it in here. And this is going to be in percentage terms. So let's copy this over. And now we can just drag it over. I don't know why I was getting some issue there. Okay, so here we go. And we'll delete these value errors because you know, obviously we have some missing data here. But yeah, so here are our common size financial statements. So this allows us to examine what percentage of sales revenue is represented by our line items. So if I zoom in here, you can get a better sense of this. So uh, what this says is our cost of revenue. So our, our cost of goods or you know our inputs is 83% of total revenue. It's fluctuating, but it's a little lower in the last year or so, which is a good thing because it means we could have a, a higher gross profit margin. Uh, if we scroll down here, interest income. Our interest income percentage, it's higher. Yeah, so this is not a good thing. It means that our interest expense is increasing through time. Also, if we look at net income, yeah, so, okay, our net income here, it was negative in the first year. It's positive in the first year. Essentially, we have become more profitable as a percentage of uh, sales revenue. So the reason we like to use these, uh, these common size financial statements is they do allow us to look at how a line item on the balance sheet or the income statement has changed through time. And we can also compare uh, across firms if we really, really want to. So that's that. Okay, so let's wrap up. Uh, typically, we use ratio analysis in fundamental analysis. I mean, it's just one piece of our, one tool on our tool belt. Uh, we do it because it's really the most basic part of fundamental analysis. If you're not using ratio analysis when analyzing firms, quite frankly, you're, you're not doing it right. Uh, and ratio analysis, it's used to compare firms to themselves historically and their competitors contemporaneously. And we can also do you know, create common size financial statements. So common size income statements, common size balance sheets. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you.